Warning! This program features several abandoned brutalist buildings, distressing landscapes, as well as bleak piles of concrete and somber semi-deserted sidewalks. May not be suitable for viewers who are not passionate about post-Soviet decadentism. Back a couple of years ago, we paid a visit to what was the most depressing town in Russia by the name of Vorkuta in the Arctic Circle. But you know what they say about places at such a northern latitude? They tend to differ vastly depending on the time of the year that you visit. And at the time of our first visit, it was the middle of summer and I've now decided to come back in the middle of winter just to see if there's any difference in the way that Vorkuta looks like between summer and winter and see if it still actually is the most depressing town in Russia. In today's video we find ourselves in Vorkuta, a town that we had already visited in the past when we first wanted to see what Russia's most depressing town looked like. There are many reasons as to why Vorkuta is considered to be so depressing. First and foremost, Vorkuta was founded in the 1940s to serve as a gulag. The Soviet Union had just found immense deposits of coal that many many criminals and political prisoners were sent on a one-way ticket to Vorkuta to work in the coal mines of the area. The coal mining industry would then fall into disrepair in the 1980s 80s and a lot of the mines were closed or had their activities strongly reduced. At the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, obviously gulags were no more. And the people who had been working in the mines were normal miners who suddenly found themselves with no job and were forced to leave the town. Since 1989, Vorkuta has been experiencing a steady population decline. This is the reason for the several abandoned commie blocks to be found all over Vorkuta that when we last visited left us with a very creepy sensation. And the last but not least reason as to why Vorkuta is so infamous is its location. The town is well above the Arctic Circle and extremely isolated, considering that its residents routinely embark on a 20-hour train ride across the frozen tundra to reach the closest town with direct air links to Moscow. The fact that it is now winter and the whole place is covered in snow and it's currently minus 25 degrees Celsius is not the only difference between the first and what is now the second visit that we're paying to Vorkuta. If you remember, last time we started out in the center of a town that had a population of 150k people during the 1980s but that now has less than 50k people, 50,000 people. So during our first mission we started out in the center and then we continued towards the outskirts just to see the villages around the town of Vorkuta. We're doing the opposite today as we're just now starting out in the middle of this fully abandoned village 15 kilometers from Vorkuta. You've got abandoned buildings with bursted out windows all over the place. This actually used to be the only school, the only elementary school of this village which is actually called, which was called Savietsky. What a name, right? It doesn't leave much to the imagination. Savietsky obviously means Soviet. This is a map of the entire mining infrastructure surrounding the urban municipality of Vorkuta. Along the main coal mine near Vorkuta proper, 13 additional mines were established around the town. For each of these 13 mines, new settlements were founded to provide housing for the miners. Some of these outposts even peaked at a population of five digits, but from the 19s onwards, they have been been losing a massive amount of population as the mines were gradually shut down. In our last video from Vorkuta, we started near the train station where you could find the majority of the people who are still living in Vorkuta. Then we had an amazing stroll towards the outskirts of the town and the settlements around Vorkuta, which looked like complete ghost towns. And the very last difference between today and the last time that we came to Vorkuta is that today 
I'm actually not by myself. For the 24 hours that we had at our disposal this time, we would have started our mission in the abandoned village of Savietsky, to then continue towards the city limits of Vorkuta and make it our goal to reach the center of the town by nightfall. This was going to be a real challenge, but I wanted to put my body and my survival skills to test. I wanted to say if, in spite of the climate and the urban logistics of the place, I was still going to be able to make it until the evening to find myself a room in the only hotel that you can find in Russia's most depressing town. So I've got three big Russian dudes keeping me company for this trip to Vorkuta and the best thing is that actually one of them was able to get a hold of a drone so for once it's not only my action camera that we need to be relying on but we're actually going to be able to get a very nice drone view as you can see of a village that pretty much has had the same history as Vorkuta it was founded to give housing to the people who were coming from all over the Soviet Union to work in the coal mines around this area of the Soviet Arctic and then obviously after a while the coal industry fell into decline a couple of the mines that were giving jobs to people around here were shut down and obviously there wasn't any more reason for people to keep living at such a northern latitude in such an inhospitable place in all seriousness, big shout out to Slava for allowing me to use his own drone footage from Savietsky. From one side, I wasn't considering the absolute devastation of Savietsky to be that depressing just yet. At the end of the day, this was going to be like any other urbex, with the only peculiarity that this was at 67 degrees of latitude north. It would have been very interesting to wait until later on in the day, when we would go and and see if the derelict commie blocks of Vorkuta were still there and if there were still people living inside of those commie blocks as we saw in our last visit. <laughs> and by the way, the way that I had met my travel comrades was absolutely random. When I was traveling on the 50-year-old Soviet Antonov taking me on the bi-weekly flight to Vorkuta, I had met Dennis, a very kind guy who then invited me and a couple of his friends in exploring around the area. And without a doubt, undoubtedly, there was no way in hell that I would decline the invite of three random Russians to explore some random ghost towns in the Russian Arctic. We're now attempting to climb this comic block right here, five floors, we're here with... Dennis, who's actually a native of these northern lands of Russia, even though he actually comes from a bit further south. So this is definitely a territory that is very interesting for, for him pretty much to see as well. We're gonna try and climb all the way to the fifth floor because you also have to think that we're right on the border between Europe and Asia because the Ural Mountains, they're not far from here at all and actually we're trying to climb up to the fifth floor in order to see these mountains which conventionally mark the border between Europe and Asia. Возможно, мы там увидим больше интересного, но придется больше пройти по снегу. Yeah. Yeah, можем сюда зайти. По-моему, можно, можно сюда. You can see that we're getting a very warm welcome from what I think is a toy bear. Very warm welcome is probably not the right choice of words considering the temperature but yeah this is just a puppy hopefully we won't encounter any any real bear be it polar or be it brown obviously polar bears are very much a possibility considering that one of the northernmost seas of russia the kara sea is not that far up north Я обычно по таким местам хожу, чтобы видеть детали того, как люди жили, знаешь, книги. Стараюсь читать, как бы понять, чем они жили. Интересно понимать всегда, кто жил в квартире, если это была семья, пара, сколько детей и кем занимались. Ну, 
Понятно, уже здесь все занимали шахтерами, да? Ой, тоже написано про лицари всех стран. Соединяйтесь. Вау. The apartments here in Sovietski are probably one of the best preserved example of urbex that you can find pretty much in Russia just because you don't have that many people venturing this far to explore the abandoned flats and the abandoned comic blocks of of Sovietski and look at what we've got this is pretty much the document that Soviet kids and probably Russian kids in the 90s and the early 2000s used to get at the end of their school year with all their marks for every subject maths, science, history, geography and all that sort of stuff and we can actually see the name of the girl at this point that used to live in this apartment obviously her father was a miner working in some of the coal mines around Sovietsky and her name was Shestakova that was the last name and the first name Lyuda meaning Lyudmila and you can actually see Pralitsari Vsech Stran Proletars of the whole world united together this is actually very interesting and look Vladimir Lenin У тебя тоже был такой? Oh wow, that's a Psyduck! Pokemon apparently was very popular in Northern Russia as well. So we got to the very last floor of this Khrushchevka, five-story Khrushchevka. And from here you've actually got a very nice view on uh, the polar euros the mountains that i was telling you about oh my god look at them it's actually a very nice view because you've got these colors of the sunset i actually don't want to get too close to the window just because i'm not going it's, it feels like everything could actually fall apart and collapse at any moment now but yeah it's actually beautiful the sun is about to set it's almost 11 a.m. and it's setting right behind the polar urals over there. Beyond those polar urals, it's Salekard, the capital of the Yamalonyenets Autonomous Okrug, whereas here we're still in the Komi Republic, which is another federal subject of Russia. Beyond those mountains, it's Siberia, it's the Asian part of Russia. I mean, Exploring this type of landscapes is absolutely amazing, let me tell you that, but doing it in this weather, oh my god, I've got two pairs of gloves and I've still got my hands that are hurting right now because of the temperature, but thank god we've got our own car, meaning that we're now gonna get inside, get some warmth back into my limbs and then hopefully we'll already start heading towards Vorkuta, actually going to a place where people still live. From one point of view, I knew that having the chance to get back into the car whenever I wanted definitely was making my mission of making it to the evening without freezing to death way easier. But I also knew that I wouldn't have enjoyed the company of my dear Russian comrades for the whole duration of the day. And I would soon find myself to be completely alone in fighting against the incredibly harsh weather conditions. Bye Sovietsky, bye bye! See you next time! Maybe. Per our calculations, we were going to travel 10 miles to the southwest on a road that today probably has 1 20th of the traffic that it used to enjoy maybe 30 years ago. We were crossing the tundra, that type of terrain that is very typical above 65 degrees of latitude where the permafrost barely allows for any kind of vegetation to grow. <laughs> между урбан пейзаж, landscape, архитектура и все, и красота, природа, по-моему. Слева, да. Нужно темно. Полярная ночь. А, ну да, но даже если это полярная ночь, а все равно есть такие, есть свет за три или четыре часа даже. Это очень хорошие и красивые цветы, потому что всегда рассвет, а потом Сразу, 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 да, сразу закат, есть небо на таком свете. Розовый, 
Halfway through my mission, I unfortunately had to part ways with my dear comrades. I was now going to be completely by myself in a hostile climate, made even worse by the weather suddenly taking a turn for the worse. I didn't even think this was possible, but it looks like filming today has gotten even more complicated because of the huge snowstorm that has risen and a very strong wind, as my grandmother used to say. You always gotta be careful in the Arctic because the weather can change any moment. Obviously, my grandmother had never been further north than 40 degrees of latitude. But anyway, today we definitely feel like the people that the writing over there is dedicated to because at the top of this, oh my god, oh, at the top of this nine story building, you've got Pacheritelium Zapagliaria. Slava, which means glory to the explorers of the Arctic. And today, in this weather, in this fantastic town, we definitely are, and we definitely feel like explorers of the Arctic, of the Soviet Arctic. We just got to this street, which is quite remarkable because the name of this street is Ulitsa Nabereznaya. So basically this used to be, and still is to be honest, the river walk because all of these flats and apartment blocks right here are facing the river of Vorkuta, the Vorkuta river which flows through the city and then continues north into the Kara Sea, one of the northernmost seas of the whole of Russia. And said river you can actually see it from here. Well, you can't really make it out because it's completely frozen and covered in snow. Or maybe you can actually make it out. And what is even more remarkable is what you have on the other side of the river. What you have on the west side of Vorkuta, which is a neighborhood that is now completely abandoned as it used to house the prisoners of the Vorkut Gulag. The area on the other side of the river was connected to the rest of Vorkuta only via a scary and precarious suspension bridge and was known as the historical settlement of Rudny. The very first prisoners of the Gulag of Vorkuta were stationed in the barracks of Rudny. It was there that the Zex, the Russian word for prisoner, could get some well-deserved rest from their shifts in the mines underground. Rudny was was later abandoned after the gulags were closed, while on the side of the river that I was on, the landscape wasn't that much more cheerful, but at least some people were living there. But I'm still not giving up! <laughs> I've still got hope! I've still got some faint hope of managing to get a decent video out of this miserable day in Vorkuta. I kept going on this street right here on the river walk just to get to this monument that I knew that I was going to find here because I was here already a couple of years ago. It says Pamici Jortv Politicheskih Repriesi. Maybe you don't even need a translation considering that you've got a huge stone with barbed wire on top. But this is basically in dedication to the victims of the Gulag. You have to consider that a lot of people came to Vorkuta because they were attracted by the salaries here that were higher and above average. But a lot of people that are still, admittedly, living in Vorkuta today are descendants of the people who were forcefully moved here from all over the Soviet Union. So I'm talking about people whose grandfathers and grandmothers were prisoners of the Gulag of Vorkuta. So this is still fairly generic because it mentions politicheske repressi, so political repressions. But obviously the reason why it's standing right here is because right on the other side of the river you've got Rudnik. In this spot right here, in this exact spot a couple of years ago, we found an abandoned Volga car that I mistakenly referred to as a Lada. But now the Volga is no more. If you remember, there was an abandoned Volga, which is now, after a couple of years, been taken away. Wow! 
just look at this landscape right here <laughs> I made it Vorkuta I made it to Vorkuta how crazy is that on the other hand, at least now, we can say that there is indeed a Lada Giguli when the Volga car once stood a couple of years ago. And if you remember, for that thumbnail of our first video in Vorkuta, I was using a screenshot of this place right here with the Volga car on the foreground and this five-story Khrushchevka on the background. Now, obviously, the Volga car is no more, but the five-story Khrushchevka is still here. Since we're talking about cars in Vorkuta, I need you all to remember a very important detail. Any wheeled vehicle is absolutely useless if you're planning on leaving Vorkuta on it. Vorkuta is essentially an island on land. There is a road that leads out of Vorkuta to the secondary outposts that we talked about earlier, but there is no road that connects it with the rest of the Russian federal network. The only way to reach Vorkuta by land from the capital of the federal subject where the town is located, the Komi Republic, is via train. On the railway tracks that were, of course, built by Gulag prisoners. The only thing that was left for us to do was to explore the center of the town, hoping that it would give us a bit of a more joyful impression compared to the outskirts that still suffer from the dark history of the place. I am now again at a very familiar place because I definitely remember this building or rather I remember its location at this point of Lenin Street because this building to be honest used to look fairly different back a couple of years ago it was looking a lot worse than this and I distinctly remember this one having another communist slogan on top Bolshe Uglia Rodine, which was a slogan that was encouraging the workers of Vorkuta to work hard to produce and to extract even more coal that would have been put to good use for the sake of the motherland. And that's why you see many writings, like for example this one on the top of this building, Bolshe Uglia Rodine, over there, which means uh, please give even more coal to our motherland, to our Soviet motherland. Well, that old looking slogan has now been removed in favor of, look at that, you've got Vorkuta Ugol, because these are the headquarters of the company of the organization that is pretty much giving jobs to 80% of the population of Vorkuta that is still remaining nowadays. And then on the left side, you've got the Russian flag and on the right hand side, you've got the flag of the Komi Republic, of which Vorkuta, even after all the people who have left, is still the third largest city by population. And right in front of the main headquarters of Vorkuta Ugol, look at this, you've got a new bus stop. I don't recall seeing these ones a couple of years ago, to be honest, and now, apparently, on the main street of town, they've installed these heated bus stops, which are pretty much the opposite to the ones that you have in Dubai. So you've got this small room where the air is obviously heated, with the only difference being that from here, in Dubai, you've obviously got cold air coming out, whereas here, where it gets to approximately 70 degrees Celsius colder than it usually is in Dubai, you've got very hot air. So well done, local administration of Vorkuta. Actually now, two marshrutkas, two buses, two local buses have just got to the bus stop where we were just at. And still here on the main square of Vorkuta, Look at what you've got, you've still got a Christmas tree, isn't that amazing? Very lit like this, it actually looks very nice. I'm thinking that who would not want to spend not too long, not necessarily the rest of your life, but maybe 5, 10, 15 years here in Vorkuta, taking advantage of the very low cost of living, both in terms of renting an apartment or even buying a whole flat for yourself. I'm actually thinking that one thing that we haven't done today yet is actually check out the restaurants that we can find here in Vorkuta. So let's go and get something to eat. And while we're sitting at the restaurant, why don't we have a look at the rental market of Vorkuta? 
those who know me well know that I've got a very romantic dream of leaving everything behind and become a hermit. Going to retire in a place isolated from everything and everyone where the cost of living is low and maybe be able to work remotely. Maybe Vorkuta could have been the perfect place for it, pay almost nothing in rent, work for a western company with a western salary, to have enough money to then buy a mansion in Canada, maybe in Toronto, in Montreal, or even Alert. Don't judge a book by its cover, we would have had everything that we needed if we were to move to Vorkuta. A decent internet connection and heating systems working like crazy between September and June. Yo, cheese, I got into this place, which is quite modern. I quite like it, I have to say, as you can see. Obviously, there are a lot of places in Vorkuta where you can have more of a Soviet vibe, but for my cappuccino, I want it to be comfortable, and most importantly, I want it to be warm. So I was just now looking on Tuavito, which is pretty much the Russian website where you go looking for apartments to buy. We definitely do want to buy an apartment in Vorkuta. I'm looking for rentals for the moment, so I'm looking for monthly rentals basically. So we're talking medium term. And if you were to rent an apartment in Vorkuta for a month, let's see, around the Lenin Street, which is the main street of the town, in the very center, you've got one for 25,000 rubles per month, which is what? 250 euros for rent to live in Vorkuta. Would you do that? For a 60 square meter, three bedroom apartments. This one, on the other hand, is a bit more expensive. It's 30,000 rubles, 300 euros. This one is 35,000. If you were to look around the residential area where we were at near the river a couple of hours ago, let's see, I'm expecting those ones to be cheaper. And indeed, this one is already 18,000 rubles. So that's 180 euros and again this one is the same this one is 13,000 rubles this might be the cheapest apartment that you can get in Vorkuta if you want to come here for a month to work on a book maybe study for your exams at university or something you can get this apartment for 130 euros it doesn't even look that bad if we were to buy, on the other hand, you can see that there's a lot more choice just because of the nature and the history of the town. So for example, again, in the city center, you can get an apartment for 600,000 rubles. So that's what, 6,000 euros, and you can get yourself an apartment here in Vorkuta. Again, if you were to go towards the cheaper areas, let's see, this one is, 2,500 euros. This one is what? 1,000. Oh, this might actually be the cheapest apartment that I've ever seen for sale. 1,500 euros, 150,000 rubles for an apartment of 35 square meters. If there's anybody who's interested in moving with me to Vorkuta, just send me a DM on my Instagram, at Dave Legenda. Maybe we can split the cost of renting and save up even more money. But for the moment, we had to look for short-term accommodation and not so much long-term. I was now going towards the coordinates where, according to Yandex Maps, we would have found the only hotel in the town of Vorkuta, in the very center. But I also had the chance to see even more remnants of the Soviet Union in the shape of hammers and sickles and huge Soviet slogans painted on the sides of some commie blocks. Darkness is already descending upon the town of Vorkuta, but don't let that fool you. It's only 12 p.m. and I was thinking that obviously during my first visit to Vorkuta we were talking about the huge number of people who have left Vorkuta over the course of the last 30 years compared to the population that used to be inhabiting these streets and these houses that we can see with our own eyes right now. And those people who have, however, stayed, they still wish that they could go back to the times of the Soviet Union, to the times where Vorkuta was probably one of the most important towns of the entire Russian Arctic. In other words, all they wish is for this dude to come back. The founder, one of the founders of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lenin. He's the guy who we couldn't really find in Sovietsky for whatever reason. Maybe the statue or the bust of Lenin that was there in Sovietsky had been removed 
for whatever reason, but we can definitely find him here in the very center of Vorkuta. And obviously the main street in town, which is right in front of Lenin's statue, is named after Lenin too. You can see it right here. Ulitsa Lenina, Lenin Street. And right on Lenin Street, I've got to give this one to the administration of Vorkuta. This is very nice. This is probably one of the most important public buildings of the whole town. This is the Dom Kulture, or rather, Dvaryets Kulture, because this one is bigger. This is not a house of culture. This is a palace of culture. And even more importantly, it says Dvaryets Kulture Shaktiorov. It's the palace of culture of the miners, of the miners of Vorkuta. It continues over there. Ugul Eta Nastayashi Klieb Pramishlinasti. It's very fitting for a town such as Vorkuta. It says coal is the bread of every industry. Despite daylight was now long gone, we could now, on the other hand, see the light at the end of the tunnel. It wasn't even two o'clock. But, because of the polar night, we already had to go and fulfill our very last task of the day, which was going to be getting to our hotel. This mission had been a little bit different from usual. We hadn't traveled millions and millions of miles on ancient trains or Soviet airplanes to reach some random places in the middle of nowhere. We had just stayed around Vorkuta for the whole duration of filming. Bo, as the end of the day, as the great Michael Jeffrey Jordan used to say, any kilometer above the Arctic Circle is the equivalent of a hundred kilometers around the equator. Rejoice, ladders and gentlemen, after walking around the streets of one of the coldest places we've ever visited. Looks like we found a building where hopefully we can get some shelter from the frosty winds of Vorkuta and from the wind chill that has now reached below minus 30 degrees Celsius. Indeed, the lit word over there is Gastinica, which is the Russian word for hotel. And I was waiting all day to see the Russian word for hotel. On the longer side, on top of it there, it's not lit, but you can actually read Vorkuta. So apparently the name of this hotel, they didn't have much imagination again, as it usually happened in Soviet times, because the name of this hotel is the same as the one of the town, Gastinica Vorkuta. And I really hope they have at least one room available for me. Well, I'm not quite sure what I'm saying, at least, at the end of the day, it's only one room that I need, but... I mean, judging by the amount of lit rooms and windows that I can see from here, I think it's one, two and three and four, the rooms that might be taken. So we shouldn't have too many problems. Which is to be expected anyway, this building, this hotel was planned for the times when Vorkuta had three times the amount of population that it has now. So let's go and see what the reception looks like and let's go and ask for a room. Getting into the hotel wasn't even that easy because of the three doors that had been installed to isolate the interior from the frosty winds of the streets of Vorkuta. Not even the three sets of doors could however prevent my camera from steaming up due to the contrast in temperatures. At the reception was a very kind kid, native to the lands of Vorkuta, which was quite surprised in seeing somebody like me. Understandable, considering that the last time that an Italian was there was in 1864. You like uh, football? Uh, I prefer basketball. No, Italia, I know about football. Football is very popular in Italy. Milan, Inter, Real. Yes, the command of football is this. No, yet. No professional. It's only for you. And the very last thing that was left for us to do before officially announcing the successful completion of our mission was putting a signature on the contract that would allow me to spend the night at Hotel Vorkuta. How's the room? Is the room good? Yes. Yes? Nice. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much, Nikita. Yes. 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 Davide. Thank you very much. A 
Hey, yo, 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 welcome to my crib here in Vorkuta. This is my hotel room that I paid 3,000 rubles for, roughly $35 for a single bed, a very vintage table, a nice television from where we will be able to catch some Russian TV, doubt it, <laughs> and most importantly, Look at this, we've got, you're never gonna guess it, a toilet which has just been disinfected according to this thing right here. Are we gonna trust it? I guess we have no other option. We've got a bathtub, so we'll be able to have a bath in Vorkuta and included in the offer from Gastimitsa Vorkuta, from Hotel Vorkuta, are even two towels. Wow, this is the best hotel ever. This is definitely the best hotel in Vorkuta. It is also the only one, but shh, don't tell that to anyone. And look at the view from the fifth floor of Hotel Vorkuta. What an amazing view over the cold main streets of what people say is the most depressing town in Russia. It's been a great pleasure coming back to Vorkuta and it's been one of the greatest pleasures in the history of pleasures to come back to a place which we first visited back when we first started our career of exploring post-Soviet decadentism. This, as we expected first thing this morning when we were in Sabietsky, is definitely a town that differs greatly between winter and summer. And I have to say, in winter, it actually looked a lot better because of the snow and the ice probably covering its imperfections, but also because of the fact that something has been done over the course of the last couple of years. Obviously, you've still got a lot of Khrushchevkas and, and people living in places where you wouldn't imagine people are actually living. But it's actually improving and I like that quite a lot. So well done Vorkuta. I won't refer to Vorkuta as the most depressing town in Russia anymore. I'll just say that this is probably the coldest town in Europe now. Because we're still 50 kilometers west of the Ural Mountains, meaning that technically, despite the northern latitude, we're still very much in Europe. Right? I'll see you next time. Cheers! Thank you! Bye!